everyone. Welcome to our panel here at the Diabetes Daycation. Um, I'm so glad that you've all kind of made it with us through the day today. Um, you know, this really is the silver lining of doing these events virtual is getting to have so many people together, um, you know, for these panels. We get to have people from across the ocean join our panel today, which is pretty exciting. Um, so the way this is going to work today, this is really one of my favorite things to do here at TCOID since we've gone virtual, which is we have these panels with some of our nation's experts in diabetes who are here to answer your questions today. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A, the question and answer box. Um, don't worry because we will not get to all of your questions today, but your questions will be answered. If they're not answered live, they will still be answered later on. Um, so not to worry and um, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and let the panel um, introduce themselves. So Robin, why don't we start with you? Aloha everyone. My name is Dr. Robin Miyamoto. I'm a clinical health psychologist with the Johnny Burns School of Medicine here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Thank you so much, Robin. Jennifer. Hi everyone. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jennifer Lowe. I'm Chief of Endocrinology at Kaiser Permanente and I'm thrilled to be here this morning with all of you. Great, thank you. Um, Alan. Okay, I think I'm on. Uh, good morning, well, I guess depending where you are, good morning, good afternoon, good day, whatever it is. Um, I'm Alan Parsa, I'm an endocrinologist here in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, also associate clinical professor at, at John A. Burns School of Medicine um, here in, in Hawaii, University of Hawaii. You're making us all jealous with that gorgeous, beautiful, natural background that you have. I might as well get a little bit all the way around, see if we can get some diamond head in there. I don't there know if it you is. can see. There it is, gorgeous. Yeah. Love it. Before, might as well stick to it. Give you guys a little island look while we're out here. Looks great. And last but not least, Steve. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank Hi, Alan. Hey, Jen. Hey, Robin. Um, I work with Tricia at the University of California, San Diego and the Veterans Hospital uh, and uh, do a lot of work with TCOID, my favorite not-for-profit organization. Great, okay, well, let's jump right in. Um, one of the first questions I see here in the Q&A box is a really hot topic right now, super common question, and that's about diets. So the particular one in the Q&A box is asking about the keto diet and intermittent fasting, which are both really hot topics right now. I think everybody wants to know about them, but when your patients are asking you, you know, we can generalize it and say, what kind of diet do you recommend for your patients? And are the keto diet and intermittent fasting beneficial for patients with diabetes? Can you get cauliflower rice in a box lunch in Hawaii? That's my question. Um, I'll just I'll just open it up and you guys can jump in there. But, you know, the, the ketogenic diet, um, a lot of people with type 1 have tried it. It's really good on the blood sugars. Um, I find that uh, cutting carbs is always a good thing for calories and to keep the blood sugars down. If you have type two and if you do your best at cutting the carbs, uh, uh, then you're gonna lose weight as long as you can do it over the long term. To get into the ketosis range, you know, you have to eat really very little carbs and then your body starts to burn more fat. So, um, you know, with anything you wanna do to reduce your total calories and carbs, um, you know, it's fine with me as, as a caregiver. I don't know, what do you guys think? Um, um, me personally, I oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll let Alan, you go first. My whole thing with dieting is, is the big problem that people have with dieting is that dieting is that they're, they're fat diets, you know, they're hard to maintain. So if you can go to the ketogenic type of diet, it's okay to do for a certain period of time. But after a certain amount of time, if you just can't hold on to that low carb type of diet, all the weight that you have lost over that time can really come back and it can come back with a vengeance. So it does great on sugars. Um, for certain people, you got to watch out for, you know, watch that ketosis. But otherwise, it, it works really well. But 
the transition of once you decide to come out of that diet, that's where, you know, it's not good just to make those initial gains. You got to maintain those gains for the rest of your life. I think that's where the hardest part comes from. So I agree with Dr. Parsa. I think that um, some folks do very well on um, the keto diet and or on a low carb diet where they cut carbohydrates can be very beneficial um, in terms of blood sugars and weight loss. But really, I encourage my patients to think about, um, you know, what kind of a long term diet can they maintain over their entire life? And I think the ketogenic diet is so restrictive um, that it is really hard to maintain long term. And sometimes people rebound. So, you know, they get so tired of restricting um, so significantly their carbohydrates that as soon as they stop that diet, um, most of the gains do kind of rebound. So I will say, hey, think really long term about whatever diet that you choose to do um, and see if it's something that you can maintain long term. Um, we didn't mention the intermittent fasting. We've seen a lot of actually um, people do quite well on intermittent fasting, both for weight loss um, and some people think that it might improve your insulin sensitivity some. And um, the nice thing about intermittent fasting is that there are different types of plans that you can do. So there's lots of popular ones, like the easiest one is considered the 16-8, where you fast for 16 hours and then eat for eight. Or other people do 5-2, where they fast for five days, or they eat normally for five days, and then they fast for two. So there's a little bit of room to customize it um, to your own schedule. Um, the one thing I would just say is that if you do choose to drastically change your diet, whether it be intermittent fasting or keto, um, you just want to talk to your provider because likely the medications that you are on have been geared towards your current diet. So if you make a really big change, you just want to make sure that you're communicating that so that your provider can help you um, adjust your medications um, so that you don't have like really low sugars or something if you're really changing your diet around. You know, I love what all of you said, which is, you know, you heard very kind of some similarities and differences between the answers and all of you. And I think it really speaks to the fact that, you know, as diabetes doctors, we really don't have a one size fits all plan for diets, right? It's really so individualized and in what works, you know, for each patient. So that's a great, great answers. Um, the next question that's in the chat box here is saying, uh, a patient saying they see their ophthalmologist every year that checks the retina but doesn't take a fundus photo. Should I ask him to? And I'll kind of broaden this out and say, how do you talk to your patients about what they should be saying to their eye doctors? Because I notice a lot of patients sometimes will say, well, yeah, I see the eye doctors. I get my contacts renewed every year. And, and they don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean they're having a diabetic eye exam, right? So what can we tell our patients about, you know, being specific about when they go see the eye doctor? One thing that I always like to tell my patients when they do see the eye doctor is to ask him, you know, I first ask him, you know, do they do a retinal exam? If they're not sure, make sure say, did you, did they look in your eyes for your diabetes? And if they say, yes, I, they looked, I said, what do they say? Um, a lot of times the response is everything looks fine or everything looks stable, but that's just not enough. Do you want to know, do you have eye disease that looks like it's not getting worse? Do you have no eye disease? That's, that's where it's at. So it's important to ask, you know, how does my eyes look How in terms of my diabetes? And if they say it's stable, what do you mean by stable? Stable meaning I have disease, not getting worse. So I think that's a big, uh, a big thing that they should be asking is, you know, not just okay, they look fine. You got to go that one extra step. And is it look fine with or without disease? Yeah, you know, I, I you took the words out of my mouth, Alan, because one of my biggest frustrations being at a big university hospital, even though we have an eye center, we don't seem to get any reports. And some eye doctors think it's really funny to put all those little colors and marks and, and acronyms, like we really know what that means. And so it is nice to make sure they got a dilated eye exam by someone who is familiar with diabetic retinopathy um, and versus us having to ask them. But I do ask them too, because uh, you know, it's important that they keep an eye on their eye health as well. Yeah, great advice. Um, Switching gears a little bit, Robin, you know, one of the things that we, 
I think on the, for patients and the, the doctors there, we all experience kind of this phenomenon about shame about and guilt of having type two diabetes and kind of the burden that they're dealing with. And, and can you give us your perspective on how you talk to patients about this and, and how much you feel like it influences their, their diabetes care? Sure. Thanks, Trisha. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there is a lot of guilt and shame. I think a lot of people have been told um, by people around them, their family members, you know, this is your fault. You could have done something earlier. And that kind of guilt and shame we know for any type of behavior change is not helpful. All it does is create a lot of uh, paralyzation and not not wanting to, to move from that spot, feeling really bad about things. So we got to throw the guilt out the window and really focus on what do you want to do moving forward? What kinds of changes do you want to make so that you can take control of your health and take control of your diabetes? Um, so really focusing on the things within their control. So um, not, am I going to go to the endocrinologist and they're going to pat me on the back and be really happy with me because we're not in control of our endocrinologist mood. We really need to focus on, I want to make these changes and report them back to my doctor. I want to ask these particular questions. Um, I want to get my A1C in this target range, but those setting those goals within their control becomes so important. The guilt part really is just going to hold you back from being able to um, make the necessary changes. Could I, could I ask Robin, um, Trish and I gave a lecture earlier this morning on some of the different hot areas and treating type two. And there was a comment in the chat box by a woman because we were talking about all the different medications and she, and she wrote, I am so embarrassed to be on so many medications. And I know people don't like taking, you know, a ton of medications, I, I don't blame them, but you know, type two is a polypharmacy condition and people type two need to be on a lot of medications if they want to control all of the ABCs we talked about. What, what do you do to help people uh, overcome the barriers of being on a lot of prescription medications that us caregivers seem to prescribe for them because they need it? Right, right. So I think, you know, with my patients, when I talk to them, we really focus on level of functioning. How many pills you take is not a direct correlation of how healthy or unhealthy you are, that you're a good person or a bad person. We really want to focus on level of functioning. So if you are on 10 medications and your blood sugar is in range, your blood pressure is in range, your kidney function is good, then that's awesome. That's the focus, right? It's the outcomes. It's not how we get there. And your information about how many medications you take, that's your personal information. That's not information you need to share. Um, that's not, you know, when people ask you how you're doing, you don't have to say, oh, well, I just increased from nine medications to 10 medications. That's your personal information. And I, I'm very certain that I can speak for the physicians on the panel when I say that they are not judging their patients. Like, oh man, you know, now Mr. Smith is on 12 medicines, you know, because he's just not taking good care of himself. No, that's not the case. Their goal is to get you to meet your goals. Um, so I think really focusing on that level of functioning and longevity, right? If, if you have to start medications early, but it means that you're going to be able to control your diabetes in the long haul, it's absolutely worth it. Well, well that's, said. That's such a, a good transition um, to a couple of other questions I see here in the chat box, which are kind of around the hemoglobin A1C. Um, so one of the questions is asking, you know, once you're 65 years old, do you have a different goal for your A1C? So I'd like to hear the panel comment on how, you know, not everyone has the same A1C target and maybe talk about that a little bit. And then there's another question about A1C relating to what should we be looking at, the A1C or the time and range on our continuous glucose monitoring? Can we talk about what that means a little bit? Go for it, Jen. Um, I would say that, um, Trisha, I totally agree. And I think everyone has their own individualized A1C target. And it's really important to have that conversation with your provider to say, hey, what is my A1C target? Because we're, we're all not the same. 
And so just to, you know, review for people, the reason why we have an A1C target is so that we want to be able to prevent long-term complications of diabetes over over a long, long term, 10, 15, 20 years, um, as well as to help you feel very healthy and to feel good in the short term as well. And so um, coming up with your actual A1C goal is really dependent on many of your own individual factors, what other medical problems you might have, um, kind of how long you're expected to live, um, and you know how well you're able to deal with your diabetes regimen. So each person really does have an individualized goal. So it's very important to talk about that with your, your provider. So for example, if I was maybe like 110 years old, I might not need a super tight A1C goal because I wouldn't expect to necessarily um, need tight glycemic control for the next 20 years. If I'm 20 years old, you know, and I'm expecting to live to hopefully 80, 90, 100 years old, I might want to have a tighter glycemic control um, so that there is less long-term complications from my, my diabetes. Um, so I'll start there. Um, I don't want to be the only one talking, so I can talk about yeah. time and range, but does anyone else want to address that first? If not, I can keep on going, but I don't want to hog the, hog the space here. Sure. Alan or Steve, any comments on time and range? And thank you for that, Jennifer. I, I think that was very well said. And it's so important for patients to understand that your A1C is not your buddy's A1C. Very different, right? I think one of the, the, the things to remember too, especially for some of the older folks, is taking into consideration who you live with. If you live alone, um, having a super tight control over your sugar and you're older maybe isn't the best idea because if you have a lot of lows, there's not going to be someone there to check on you. So that would be a reason to really communicate with your providers about what kind of support system you have. Um, so just um, from that perspective, I think that's important to keep in mind. So sleep with someone every night, Robin, is that your suggestion? Uh, Alan, I know you got some words of wisdom and I'll, I'll add a few things if I think so, but I love hearing you guys because so, so much common sense uh, information you're giving the folks today. Yeah, um, I mean, those, those are all great comments. I mean, I, I kind of go along that same theme for with a lot of people and, and it's not just, I think the A1C sometimes gets us a little bit wrapped up as far as what exactly it means and what it's going to do if it's too low or if it's too high. Um, one thing we don't want to see to kind of not kind of to kind of go on to that time and range side of things is, is we don't want to see numbers jumping up and down, up and down. If you have someone who's got an A1C of seven, you know, that tells us your av average blood sugar over the last few months is around 150, but that's great and all, but you have to remember what an average is. An average is combining all the highs and lows put together and kind of dividing them out over the last few months. So if someone's has sugars between 50 and 350, they might still have an A1C of seven, but they're at much higher risk of something bad happening than someone who has a sugars that's bouncing around between, you know, 135 and 165. So it's not, so the time and range is, is a tool for us to kind of prevent that high variability. You don't want to be sugars jumping up and down, up and down. Um, and I think that's, that's very important. And when it comes to A1C lowering, it also depends on the medications. You want. If you're on insulin, maybe you don't want sugars as tightly controlled because you have higher risk of having the low blood sugars. If you're on medications that doesn't really have a risk of low sugars, then being having an A1C of 5.8 is perfectly fine because that's where your body, you know, you're being healthy, you're doing everything you need to do. So it's, it's, it, the number is just kind of a way to guide us. The CGMs are great because it gives us an idea of how you're attaining that number. And then the medications is a good way of telling us, well, what is your risk of having some uh, a low blood sugar and a risk of the complications that come with low blood sugars? And the other, you know, the other important thing that goes along these lines and kind of what Robin was talking about earlier is that, you know, we, we as providers do not want you to hang your hat on your A1C. Don't let it get you down and don't let your A1C define you, right? Because you could have a very kind of good A1C and have lots of low blood sugars and that's actually not safe for you, right? So just like you were saying, so 
I think it's also kind of important take home message with all of this that you're hearing is that A1C is not the end all be all by any means. All right, another question here. We're kind of shifting gears all over the place. So, um, but I think this is an important question. Um, is there such thing as diabetes remission or being able to get your diabetes to go away? Any thoughts on this or how do you talk to your patients about this? I, I can start off a little bit. Um, once again, I'm really enjoying hearing everybody. So, so I had nothing to add to the last conversation. You guys are so, so cool. Um, well, you know, it's a cure, remission, reversal. Um, on one hand, there's a lot of marketing scams out there that sell supplements and crazy unproven therapies to uh, suck the money out of all you folks with type two with just hoping that it can go away. Um, and that's just terrible. These folks should be locked up. Um, on the other hand, let's just say you have type two, you get really motivated, you start exercise and you lose a little bit of weight, you get on some good medication um, and your A1C goes, goes to normal and you might get off a lot of medication. That's awesome. You still have type two, you're not cured, but you, you could say you, you uh, reversed your diabetes, but remember that anybody who does really well with their type two, if they're diagnosed pretty early, they can get off medications, which should not be your first goal, as Robin kind of in, let us do in the beginning, but um, it could always come back. So it, on one hand, you know, the bad news is there's no cure for type two on the good hand, on the, on the good side, totally treatable condition. And uh, so I think just be careful on the scams out there that promise a lot of things like we can take away your diabetes. And there are a lot in San Diego. I don't know about Hawaii. I, I think it's also, you know, for patients, I think not enough patients hear that type two diabetes, even when you're doing everything right, you're taking your medication, you're eating well, you're, you know, exercising, it's a progressive disease. And so I think it's also important for patients to understand that just because you're doing everything right and you're working really hard doesn't mean you may not need another medication down the road. And that doesn't mean that you're failing, right? Or doing a bad job. Uh, okay, next question here um, about the COVID vaccine. So we talked a little bit this morning, there were some questions in the chat box in the, one of the sessions this morning about the vaccine. We've seen some changes in blood sugars kind of acutely related to the vaccine. And the particular question here was, are, are people with diabetes having worse kind of reactions to the vaccine, that kind of fever and fatigue and kind of local rea or, or acute reactions that people are getting to the vaccine? What are you seeing with the patients that you're seeing? And should that stop them from getting vaccinated? Uh, um, my take on, oh, go ahead. Oh, you go first, Alan. Uh, my take on the vaccine is very, you know, I mean, people think that because they're diabetic, they're going to, or have diabetes, they're going to be at higher risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus, which isn't true. You know, your, your risk of contracting is the same as anybody else's. If you're around someone who's coughing on you, you can get it. The risk is really based on once you contract it, what are your risk factors? You know, if you have pulmonary, if you have lung issues, if you have very poorly controlled your A1Cs in 12, 15, you're at higher risk of something happening. And it's not necessarily just with coronavirus, it can happen with any infection. You know, we see people who get infected with diabetes and they end up with like leg ulcers and amputations. That's, it's a similar type of thing, get your sugars under control and you really reverse a lot of those risk factors. So getting the vaccine, I haven't seen people who have a higher reaction. Some people are more sensitive to the vaccines. You know, if they get the flu shot, they usually kind of get the muscle aches and the fevers after the flu shot. So if you kind of develop those type of symptoms, you may develop it with the COVID vaccine. Remember that the vaccine is just basically mimicking a response to an infection that your body would would normally go through if it got an actual infection. And so how your body is going to respond is going to be how it's going to respond to any type of infection. The big question is, you know, 
because this is a newer vaccine? Are you going to be a little bit more, is it going to be a little bit more dramatic to, for you or not? But you're not actually going to get the, the virus if you, just by having the vaccine. I would just um, add also that I'm actually very strongly encouraging my patients who have diabetes to get the COVID vaccine because we know that patients who have diabetes typically do worse um, if they do get uh, COVID. So I'm encouraging everyone to go ahead and, and get the vaccine um, because overall I want them should they get should people get COVID, we know that the vaccines do two things. Number one, um, it decreases your likelihood for, for getting COVID. And number two, it decreases your chance of having poor outcomes like hospitalizations or ICU admissions um, if you if you get the vaccine. A couple things like anecdotally that we've seen, some folks have noticed that their sugars do go up a little bit for the 48 hours after the vaccine probably because the vaccine may cause symptoms, um, illness type symptoms that can lead to high glucose levels. That's okay. Um, and that is something that we can expect. So we just tell folks to stay hydrated and to have your sick plan um, ready in case you feel ill or if you need to give yourself extra doses of insulin if you're on insulin um, after the vaccine. And then most folks typically do find and notice that their sugars go back to normal. Um, after 48 hours. So far, what we've seen though is that the majority of people with diabetes seem to be having few side effects and it doesn't seem to be having a huge effect on their blood glucose level. But if you do notice that you're one of those where it goes up a little bit for the 48 hours afterwards, not to be too concerned about it and to just put your sick day plan into place. Yep, awesome. Yeah, great advice. I completely agree with you about, I think all of us are, you know, big proponents of our patients getting the vaccine and we understand it's scary and it's your choice ultimately, but I think it says a lot that everyone here, you know, is really encouraging their patients to get it. Um, let's talk a little bit more about CGM or continuous glucose monitors. Hopefully all of you out there have heard a lot about this today. Um, and in type two diabetes, there's some questions because people wanna know how do I get this covered? And you know, it really depends on what type of insurance coverage you have, unfortunately, um, with type two diabetes. But you know, should, I guess the questions I'll pose to the panel are, are CGMs good for type two? Do you recommend them? And then somebody asked a really nice question, which is how do I know about my fluctuations during the day if I don't have a CGM for some reason? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, can, I can say a few comments. I'll make it brief, but um, I'm a big believer in CGM. Of course, it's the standard of care for people with type 1 diabetes, like myself. Um, and I think I, I'm a big believer that uh, continuous glucose warning could be helpful for people with type 2 at every stage. Even though for those in pre-diabetes can really see the effects of what they eat, what they don't eat, if they take their meds people on oral medications, people are just on basal insulin and, all, and people on a full insulin regimen. However, I am a realist and you know it's, it's hard to get coverage for everybody at every stage. And those of you should know that if you're on three or more shots a day, you should be able to get it covered. <clears throat> and uh, I would encourage anybody where it thinks it may help them to look into the different plans. Each company has these starter uh, kit uh, plans or to try to get it as low a price as possible. You might wear it intermittently and then pay out of pocket. Um, uh, it's not, I mean, it's easy for me to say, uh, but I, don't, I think as far as cost of medication goes out there, it's relatively inexpensive. And these sensors last 10 days to two weeks. So that's my opening monologue on CGM. I'll, I'll jump in and add that I'm 100% with you. Um, I love CGMs and I think they're incredibly helpful for patients with type one and type two diabetes. And I agree at any point in the disease process, it is so helpful. And primarily the reason why is because you get actually a much clearer window into what's going on with your body. Um, it's hard when you just do blood glucose um, finger sticks alone because it only gives you a single point in time. And then you have to poke yourself every single time that you want to see what's going on. And so in some ways, you're a little bit blind. 
Um, with the continuous glucose monitor, it's so much more powerful because you can, like, for example, if you're on like the Libre, you can swipe it at any point um, and just get an idea of what your glucose levels are doing. It also gives you, you know, trends as well as alarms. Um, which can be really helpful, especially if you're sleeping um, and you have an alarm that you're going low. So I think they're just incredibly powerful. Um, I totally agree as well. Um, Medicare does cover um, the CGM if you are on usually three shots a day or more. And um, just check in with your plan to see a lot of them echo kind of what Medicare is doing. Um, and if you're on three shots a day or more, they'll, many plans will cover it. Um, we have looked at locally in Hawaii, um, how much does it cost to, for example, have to, to self-pay for, um, like, for example, a Libre. And often you can look and, and find different coupons online with our WellRx or with other brands um, and go to places like, for example, Costco. And it can be um, actually relatively affordable, um, especially if you don't use it all the time, but you use it sometimes to test for like 10 or 14 days and see what your blood sugars are doing and how much time you have in range. So um, yeah, if you're a little bit um, scrappy and you kind of look around and you find coupons, sometimes you can self pay for it yourself. You know, I think that's such good advice that you don't have to be on these things all the time to learn about how your body is affected by certain things, right? So even if you could get one sensor and have it on for two weeks, you can learn, you know, during that two weeks, go for it and eat your favorite foods and see what happens and go for a walk around the block and see what happens. I think it's so beneficial to learn. And the, I'm glad you mentioned Costco because it's also important to know that you don't have to be a Costco member to use their pharmacy. Um, so that's another tip in case you're looking for, and they do have very affordable meds. So um, just keep that in mind as well. And the hot dogs as well. And the hot dogs. Yeah. You could be a member to buy a hot dog. <laughs> Kosher, too. Um, okay, so I, I want to move on to some people, or there's a few questions in the chat about kidney disease related to diabetes. Um, and I think this is a great segue to kind of open, it, open up and talk a little bit about SGLT2 inhibitors and how we're really shifting gears with the way we practice now in terms of how that class of medications that we use for diabetes can now protect our kidneys. What do you have to say about that and even open it up to heart disease as well? Alan, go first, Alan. You're, you're being too quiet. Sorry, I got a little loud over here with the, the mopeds coming through. Um, so, SGLT2 inhibitors are a great new class of medications. You know, we really have to thank Rosie Glitazone, the Vandia, for pushing the FDA to say that we have to do these cardiovascular outcome studies um, because now with them, it's kind of really spring shotting us forward by years because they wouldn't have really done these studies. And now we're seeing benefits in the heart. We're seeing benefits uh, by virtue of the heart. We're also seeing in the kidneys because, you know, SGLT2 inhibitors work at the level of the kidneys. And we're seeing how things overall will, yeah, that's the problem with being outdoors is you never know what you're going to hear. Um, so that, so, I mean, they are, they do have these great benefits. You know, there's the, the new indication that just got FDA passed a few days ago for kid chronic kidney disease um, with DAPA. So, I mean, there's a lot of great data telling us that we should be using these things. And we really should. We shouldn't be just keeping them on the side and saving them for some future time. If these things are going to help prevent you, and that's, and that's the big thing about getting your A1C down low. You're trying not just to, the reason to keep your A1C low is the quality of life. You don't want to get that, go on to dialysis. You don't want to have that eye disease and go blind. You don't want to have toes amputated off. So if we can prevent the kidneys from failing and going into towards that dialysis pathway, we should. We shouldn't just sit and wait for things to happen. We should be on that forefront of medicine and really be aggressive in saying we can prevent this and we should try as best as we can. Are there thoughts on these medications? How does everybody else feel about them? Um, 
I actually am super excited about the fact that we have these these medications like the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, and then also with the GLP-1 inhibitors having um, indications for cardiovascular risk reduction. When we actually think about it, what do most folks end up well, I hate to say it, it's kind of like morbid, but like what is the greatest killer for people who have diabetes? And it's really heart disease, um, things like heart attacks or strokes. And so I know we spend a lot of time thinking about blood sugar and blood sugar is extremely important, but ultimately um, as a physician, I think it's incredibly important to also make a difference in terms of um, both the, the heart disease uh, and the outcomes for heart attacks and strokes um, and the chronic kidney disease. So um, if you have chronic kidney disease with protein in your urine, and if you are high risk for cardiovascular events, you really should be definitely on these medications to decrease your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And it is very powerful in decreasing your progression of your kidney disease. And so we really want to be thinking about not only your blood sugars, but also really reducing your risk of um, kidney disease and heart attacks and strokes. So definitely want to be on those medications if you have the right indications for it. Yeah, I, I can just add one liner. I think I think Alan and Jennifer said it all, but um, I want I don't want people to forget the basics of preventing kidney disease and heart disease. You know, I, I don't want people to say, oh, just pop this pill, you'll be safe. Don't forget the good old, you know, do your best at trying to get down to a good weight. Make sure your blood pressure is good. Your cholesterol levels are good. If you're supposed to be on like an aspirin a day, you have to ask your caregiver. Uh, and plenty of exercise, you know. So it, it, the combination is very powerful. I think too, you know, I saw some other questions related to um, kidney labs. I think just as important to know your A1C if you are becoming more and more educated about your diabetes labs that you need to know. Um, creatinine is important, but your GFR, that's a number that you can really track um, to be able to know how your kidneys are doing. And I don't know about the rest of the country, but um, in Hawaii, our labs will automatically calculate your GFR if, if it's below 60 and it'll start showing up on your lab work. So know your GFR, track it over time, and that's really going to give you another indicator of your health. There's a question in here, and absolutely, Robin, thank you for bringing that up, actually. Um, I think you're right. People don't, we focus so much on that darn A1C because that's kind of just historically was one of the only measures that we had to see how people were doing with their diabetes. But now we know so much more. And it really is, in order to take control, it really is important for the patients themselves to be asking about not just your blood sugar numbers, but kidney numbers and, and you know, asking your doctors about that you're going to get your eye exams for, all those things that we've been talking about. So that's a really good point. Um, so there's kind of on the same thing, theme of the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, there's a question about weight loss. And, um, you know, if patients are on a GLP-1 medication, should they continue and their blood sugars, you know, are doing well, should they continue to increase that GLP-1 medication to try and get even more benefit, more weight loss? Um, and then another question of, can you use SGLT2s and GLP-1s in addition to metformin? I think these medications all have a good purpose. Remember us as physicians, we are here to kind of give everyone the tools that they need to get their health in order and whatever the tool that may be. So if they're on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, and it's helping them lose weight. The way I typically do is, you know, use you as you're starting to lose weight, if you're dieting properly, if you're exercising properly, your weight's going to come down along, you know, it may help you with that behavior modification that's, that's needed. These medications shouldn't be used solely as, you know, as a weight loss drug, They're not indicated for weight loss, but they shouldn't be used to just lose weight. Don't scale the medication up just specific weight loss purposes, because if you don't modify your behavior, if you're eating cheeseburgers still and, you know, greasy fatty foods and you're going up, okay, you're eating less of it, but once you stop the medication, 
was to keep your weight down to where it is. And the whole idea behind the weight loss is to reverse a lot of those risk factors and also reverse that insulin resistance, what's causing that type two diabetes to really flourish itself. And if you can lose enough weight, your number, your A1C will come down well enough that you may not need to be on medications. You know, we're talking about reversal of diabetes. I call it, you know, um, diet controlled diabetes, where it's not medication controlled, it's diet controlled. And so the idea is to get people off medications in the end. And so just by scaling the medication up, if it's not in conjunction with diet and exercise and all the necessary things, in the long run, it really isn't going to do us that much benefit. It's going to make us feel better that the numbers have come down, but we're not really doing the, the true uh, service of getting everything, eventually getting off medications and really reversing those risks. Are there other thoughts from the rest of the panel on um, weight loss with these SGLT2s or GLP-1 receptor agonists? Um, I can comment on that. I, I I totally agree with Alan. I think it has to be combined with really a strong lifestyle modification with healthy eating and exercise. Um, I'm glad that we have these medications be because before a lot of the medications that we had actually caused people to gain weight or really um, struggle to to lose weight. So it's it's great that we have medications that not only help with glycemic control, but also make it a little bit easier for folks to lose weight. Um, but again, um, it's one of those things that uh, what I've found over the years is that um, everyone can almost out eat anything. So the medications can only take you so far. Um, and then you really, really have to be committed to really trying hard to, to, to work on unhealthy eating. Otherwise you pretty much can out eat any medication. Yeah, one, one last comment for me is that something that Trish and I spoke about this morning, that anybody that didn't miss that lecture can go back and watch it, but the different companies that make the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist drugs, and, you know, people, companies like uh, Vic, Novo with, with Victoza, Trulicity, Ozembic, they now have studied higher doses and uh, they're safe and they lead to greater A1C reduction and greater weight loss. So. It's just, it, it's a good, it's an option that you have and something to discuss with your doctor too, but you can get greater effects on your weight with the higher doses. There really has been no better time to have diabetes than right now with all the tools we have. And, you know, on that note, I'll ask each of you, we only have a couple of minutes left to give maybe your very quick closing thoughts or comments. Um, and I'll just start by saying for all of you out there, there seems to be a lot of discussion about CGM and wanting to get one. And I absolutely agree. And don't be discouraged that these are not gonna be, um, I don't think they're gonna be costly forever. I think that eventually every, everyone will have access to them. You know, it's slow, it's slow moving, but you know, each generation are getting less expensive. We're getting more access. Insurance companies are starting to, to really know the benefits. So stay positive. Um, closing remarks. Let's see, Robin, do you want to start? Robin, please. Sure. Um, I think, you know, I want to applaud everyone for being here today because that already shows your commitment to understanding your disease better and being a better advocate for yourself. I think the other part that I just want to remind people about is to, to go easy on yourself. Sometimes we are our own worst critic um, and we really get down on ourselves. And so if you think about, you know, 0% and 100%, give yourself credit for everything that you're doing. Don't just focus on this little bit like, oh, I should be doing more. Really think about taking small steps to be able to move towards health. Don't try to change everything at once and, and be kind to yourself because um, this, is, this is a lifestyle change and it takes um, perseverance and patience. Such great advice. Jennifer, any closing thoughts? I would say that I, I just wanted to echo what you said, Trisha, is that this is one of the best times to um, have diabetes just in that there is so much at our disposal now. And so I would just encourage everyone to feel a lot of hope and um, to feel a lot of um, 
you know, to, to feel that there's, there's many options. There's many things that you can do to get control of your diabetes. Um, find a care team that works with your, your own style um, and really chat with them about ways that you can take control of your diabetes um, and, and, and find that healthy life that's free of the guilt and shame that Robin has been talking about. Absolutely. Alan, any closing remarks? Yeah, I mean, everyone has such great thoughts and everything. I totally agree. TSO ID is a great, uh, a great platform to teach and educate. And I'm glad everyone was able to come and participate in it. Uh, I think that, uh, again, with everybody, you know, if you want to feel like you're working on yourself, you don't want to feel like you're struggling to do anything. If you're struggling, that's a recipe for failure. You want to feel like you're working. If it starts becoming a little overwhelming, you take a breath, you step back. You kind of look around and you kind of give yourself a second to, to take a breather. Otherwise, you know, this is a lifetime thing. It's not just going to go away on its own. So you need to be able to find a pathway that's going to that's going to lead you to the end. If you want to lose 20 pounds, we'll start with five. You, know, you just can slowly work your way to that ultimate goal. And I agree with Jennifer. You need to find somebody who uh, who can work with you, who has a similar personality. Some people need uh, the hand holding. Some people need a little scolding. It's all about what best works for you to help you get to that ultimate goal. We're here to kind of help and give the tools and hopefully we can help everyone get to uh, their ultimate goals. Such great points. Thank you. And Steve, I'll let you take us out since we're at 2.45. Yeah, well, it's been my pleasure to speak with you folks. And I learned a lot myself and coming from such a, a place of common sense and knowledge. But I would just say this in closing, um, you know, a famous quote by Sir William Osley, the best way to live a long and healthy life is to develop chronic disease and then take care of it. And that's exactly what type 2 diabetes is. A lot of people that are diagnosed, they say, oh, oh my gosh. And now they start, you know, taking control of their diabetes. They make sure their blood pressure, cholesterol is good. They start an exercise program. And I, I'm convinced that they are going to live a longer and healthy life because they got diagnosed with diabetes versus just not paying attention to their health at all. So, And also the folks at Abbott have a free um, one month trial of the Libre for any of you folks, uh, just go to the health fair in the virtual health fair and get the information on how to sign up for that. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I wish we had another hour, but thank you all so much for joining us. Really, really important words of wisdom. We appreciate it. Thank Aloha you. everyone. Aloha.